Donnybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Donnybrook. June is busting out all over with lots of topics and a great guest, Frank Viverito, the president of the St. Louis Sports Commission, is going to join us on the second half. But first, we'll kick around the news of the week, starting with Wendy Weiss, the news director for the Big 550 KTRS. Mr. Bill McClellan from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Ray Hartman from the Big 550 KTRS, where he holds court every weeknight at 9. And he's also, of course, a columnist with the Riverfront Times. We have Alvin Reed from the St. Louis American, the 97.1 FM News Talk, and 590 AM and beyond. And we're going to start with you, Alvin. I think the top story this week comes out of Florissant. Not a good situation. At least it doesn't look that way on videotape. Joshua Smith, a police officer, was caught by a ring home camera using his unmarked Florissant police vehicle, hitting a man with the car, and then getting out and apparently beating him. Well, he's going to have his day in court, and he's got a good attorney, Scott Rosenblum, as I understand it, who said that um, he made a mistake by hitting the pedestrian. However, he was fired, the officer was, by Florissant and the police department. I was wondering, hmm, couldn't they have waited for the wheels of justice to turn to see how he fared in the courtroom before they fired him? What do you think? Well, I think that they made the decision that it doesn't have to come to a court of law and you be found guilty of some crime. What you did is justifiable reason for this police force to fire you. So you're fired, okay? Um, you know, I think there have been other cases, more egregious, obviously, here in the last couple of months where, you know, police officers are fired. They haven't had their day in court, but you're fired. And I can live with that. I think that's one of the things that police departments could do more of and not wait and say, if you're going to sue union or you're going to do this, then you do it. But our first reaction is what, what I just witnessed was enough for you to not work here anymore. And I think other employees and other um, businesses face that same kind of um, punishment for errant work. And, and police officers should be no different. So, no, I, I don't think they jumped the gun on firing him, and they did not declare him guilty. From, from, a, legal, from a legal standpoint, I, I think that Chief Fagan kind of put a, you know, a, a, a nice gift with a bow in front of Scott Rosenblum when he said, no, you know, the process isn't really pay, it's not it's not playing out right now the way it normally would, but he said the people don't really have an appetite for a delay. And I thought, to me, that's the very definition of, of mob rule. And that is that should be chilling to anybody that, that you know, let the process play out and then fire him. I, I just, I don't like the fact that there are so many leaders willing to just disperse the crowd at any cost. I disagree, Wendy, because first of all, I think it's democracy in terms rather than mob rule in terms of um, <clears throat> the comments in Florissant, but they have no bearing on the criminal case. I agree with Alvin. The, the, the question of criminality and the question of employment are completely unrelated. And I think there was plenty of evidence to warrant firing this officer based on what we saw with our own eyes. That does not presume that he's going to be found guilty. He's entitled to his presumption of innocence. He is not entitled to his job, necessarily, if he did something that's that's worthy of being fired. Well, I, I, I would say that they at least need to have a more thorough internal investigation. I mean, you, you don't ever want to do something just because it's it's popular. And and I, I think that they should say, we're not going to wait months and years for the criminal court to decide. We're going to have a thorough investigation ourselves, and we're going to uh, do it judiciously, but not hastily. So I, I, I would be more aligned with Wendy on that. I would just think that um, if this video popped up and 
you, you know, we were not at this time or we were at a time where society and police got along. I still think that that would be um, a fireable offense. So I'm kind of just looking at it like if I was the chief and a, and a yeah. police officer of mine did that under any circumstance whatsoever, regardless I, of the time. And I don't think we should assume happened, that they didn't have I a thorough that, investigation. I, I just think that I would think to myself, what was that about? I really, I, I just, I don't think I need you on my police force right now. I thought and it was interesting that Scott Rosenblum sort of qualified his participation and involvement with the detective by saying, I wouldn't go within Chauvin, you know, Officer Chauvin with it, you know, with a 10 foot pole. But he said, he said the facts will prove that this, this was an accident. The St. Charles County prosecuting attorney who's taken over uh, said that T Tim Lomar said that, you know, he said, this does not look like the type of policing that we want to have anything to do with. So opinions are just right, about everywhere. Well, Wendy, and that's, that's hey. sort of making yeah. the case. I don't think we should presume anything about criminality here, but, and that's Scott's part of it. But in ter just what you just said, and, and I don't know, Bill, that there wasn't a thorough investigation in terms of employment. I mean, well, we that's don't what know. The chief said. That's what the chief said. He right. said we're that's that's all I can go on. Well, yeah, I, I'm just saying that I think that. Well. Okay, but okay. I, I think that. that right. let's, let's hold on. Uh, while, you, while we have you in front of the camera here, I want to ask you about the Fox Theater, which on its marquee on Grand Boulevard posted Blue Lives Matter in tribute or homage to Captain and Chief Dave Dorn, who was laid to rest this week after he was tragically killed trying to defend a pawn shop last week. Now, the Fox Theater got criticized for that, and it issued an apology today. What do you think? Do you think it was um, inappropriate for the Fox Theater to say, uh, Blue Lives Matter? Yeah, first of all, Captain Dorn had such a great career and has so many people. Uh, respected, uh, you know, and I, you know, his loss is is a tragedy, and apt for the Fox Theater to want to pay tribute to him is fine. Blue Lives Matter has a very definite connotation uh, to the black community, quite frankly, because it was used initially by police as as an argument against Black Lives Matter. You know, it's just like they were using All Lives Matter. And I think people have come to realize that you should be able to say Black Lives Matter without qualification and without having a counter argument to it. So I think, you know, nobody got fired. This isn't cancel culture, there's no boycott. But I think the idea that they apologize is, is in proportion. And I think it was the right thing that, that they should apologize. Was this I was, be, I'm ahead, sorry, David. go ahead, Alvin. Well, I was going to say that um, my wife's niece, so I guess my niece-in-law, is a police officer in Tacoma. And um, we we had, past tense, one of the blue, um, you know, it, it's an American flag with the, the blue and the black in it, okay? Someone felt the need to take that off of our car someplace here uh, in the last few days, all right? Um, the fact that they did that, they were, they were referencing the slain police officer, and that's all. And I don't think they had any need to apologize. And just like I felt like somebody had violated my privacy by taking that off of my car. Now their intention might have been whatever, but I mean, that's, a, that, that's too extreme one way. And to say that they have to apologize for that is too extreme the other way. So we gotta have some middle ground here. We, we've got to, just stop and think. It's like we're, we're, it, now, if you wanted to say, like, let us explain. Okay, that's one thing. But I don't think I don't feel the Fox had any need to apologize for that. Mm. Well, and I'm not sure if it was because it was all over social media. And I think initially, and I and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think initially the Fox had posted on the marquee, "Black Lives Matter," and then there was you know the chorus of what about Captain David Dorn? What about Captain David? Dorn? You know, it was, and, and so that, I, I didn't know if that was in response to the criticism that they received on social media over the, mm. the, the Black Lives Matter, the original Black Lives Matter marquee, but forgive me, I'm not up to speed on, on the timeline, but I agree clear. with you, Alvin. They should absolutely not apologize. 
Well, I think there's a difference in saying they, saying they had to and that they did the right thing by it. I, again, I didn't say they had to do it. I think it was the right thing to do because the phrase blue lives matter, particularly as Wendy just laid out, in place of black lives matter, does offend a lot of people. And by the way, I don't like the cancel culture. I don't like the political correctness. But every time someone's mm. offended by something, doesn't mean they're. Ray, I don't believe. I don't believe the family of of Captain Dorn was offended by the Blue Lives Matter marquee. So the, the point yeah. is. Hey, but Ray, well, that when did you start? You're, you're never afraid of offending people, are you? I, I was going to say, look, I can't tell you how many times I wrote something or our paper wrote something at the RFT. We lost advertisers. No kidding. Advertisers. So what? I mean, put on your big boy pants. and That's what you You know, my point is, if you're going to pick put a big marquee, you're, a, first of all, theaters probably ought to stay out of politics in general. But if you're going to put a sign on that's offensive to people, I, you know, it's not like you're some victim here. And it's not like some of these un... I, I think a lot of people. Did, I don't want now, to Ray, speak. did you yeah, say that the theaters black theaters black should black stay black out black. of politics? Theaters are firmly engrossed in okay. politics. My point is, a lot of people, whether you think they should be or not, take offense in the black community, which I don't mean to speak for, at about the phrase "Blue Lives Matter." They do, and all that's right. and, and that's Speaking, all. Okay. Speaking of police, Bill McClellan, Lisa Clancy, the chair of the St. Louis County Council has kind of kind of embraced what's now been called defund the police, although she's not using those exact terms. But she said in your paper that it's possible to move some of the money away from the St. Louis County police budget and put that to other services within St. Louis County. This just a, a couple of years after St. Louis Countyans raised their sales taxes to increase funding for the police. So what do you say about this? Well, I just think it's very bad timing on Lisa Clancy's part, because as you say, the citizens just voted to give more money to the police. And, you know, we see this time and time again, where citizens vote to do something and the money is earmarked, you know, uh, lottery money earmarked for education. And, and, and all of a sudden the, the politicians decide, well, you know, that I know the citizens meant well, but we know better. And I think as long as the citizens just voted to give money to the police, I, I don't think it's a good time for Lisa Clancy and her allies to be taking money from the police budget. I don't know if the timing's good, but I'm with her on this in that I don't, first of all, I, I hate the phrase defund the police because it's a slogan that if you have to explain it, by definition, isn't a good slogan, uh, because certainly I, I don't favor getting rid of the police, and or you know, but but I think there is a very serious argument locally and nationally over whether we should take police resources and spend more on preventing crime and not criminalizing addiction and mental health and poverty, which is what we do. Uh, we 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 treat the dick and Cory Cory Booker was great on this the other day on national TV, but it was he's making the point that we take addiction, mental health, and poverty, and we treat it with police, courts, and prison, and we've got to start attacking the causes of problems. Well, well, you know that's a that's a great argument, Ray, and and I'm all for the uh, core problems and going after them and education and everything, but I don't think that you right now take the money from the police budget and say we're actually going to give that to education for instance and education you know my, my daughter works for teach for america i believe education is a great thing but if the citizens vote to give more money to the police department i don't think that you then turn around and say well actually we're going to give that money to education for instance well, and I agree with you about there? Prop P. I understand that. Mm. It's not just Prop P money she's talking about. I think on Prop P, people should remember that a big part of Prop P, as it was sold, was about body cameras, cameras on cars, and and, t and training, increased training on de-escalation and sensitivity, whatever you want to call it, for police. That was part of what it was sold for. <laughs> I, I think that I think that Derek Chauvin should be under the jail. He should he should literally be under the jail. 
I think that George Floyd should still be walking among us and with his family and with his daughter. Now that said, there were 240 million 911 calls last year, Ray. And to, to, to suddenly say when, as you guys have all pointed out, we couldn't find enough money across this nation to fund the police properly, to hire, to get back to previous hiring levels, to suddenly say, yeah, let's try to do it with less money. Just is, is that just sounds, it's, it sounds absurd. And One I of the agree. problems and, is- And I, why, does, why does it have to come out of the police budget? Now, police are under fire now, but you know this the, the defund the police and whatnot, and this is what I you know fear. You're you're stating that every police officer is an enemy to the people and especially the black people of America. And that is wrong. And no statute or no idea should we end with the fact that let's take money from all the police departments to try to fix the problems that quite frankly, the police department didn't have anything to do with. Now, are there rogue and crazy cops? Are there racist police officers? Absolutely. They gotta be fettered out. We gotta figure out a way to do this. But to declare that we're just gonna, we're just gonna take money from the police department and send it, like you say, to education or social causes or whatnot, that's a non sequitur to me. Find it someplace else if you have to do it. And and also, okay. how about not get hey, Charlie, in the way? Charlie, how about let how about let's not find a way to get in the way of what probably a lot of us want, which is a change in the administration in Washington D.C. Let's look at the pragmatic side here. This is a bridge too far. This is you got a guy on the ropes, and then you stick your chin out there and let him take a free shot. That's that's hmm. not wise. Well, I I completely agree with Alvin on that last point with regard to this defund the police as a slogan. I think it's ridiculous. And I am, I've not said a word of bad about police officers tonight. This is the, the thinking that we have to have that I think have changed is some of those 240 million calls you talked about, Wendy, and I had Joe Patterson from the county police, the, the executive director okay. on last night. He made, and he was not, I'm not trying to interject him, but he made a point that there's a lot of calls police get that, that shouldn't even be, they shouldn't be getting, they get, he, he was saying you get a 911 call because somebody's mad about a tree in a neighbor's yard. And so the point is, there's a, a way to rethink how we allocate police resources. It's not about taking things away from them. It's, it's de, it, it's. Okay. Well, 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 you need to, you need to talk to money from the police budget and putting it to other things, Ray, isn't that? What you're defending? I think the funding. police budget should include as part of it that component of when you have somebody laying on the street drunk, instead of sending an armed officer, maybe you send somebody that can help them get alcohol or, or treatment. I mean, hey, that's, hey, hey. that's cutting a little close. Uh, Wendy, I want to ask you about uh, Chief Mary Barton. Three weeks on the job. I think she was unanimously selected and already the honeymoon is over. Because she was asked when she appeared in front of some county officials this week if she believed that there was systemic racism in the St. Louis County Police Department. She said no, and as a result, she was criticized for her remarks by Chairman uh, Lisa Clancy and then Rita Days, Rochelle Walton Gray, and a WashU professor. Do you think they went after her because she's a woman? You would have to ask them that. Um, but I only say because when, when they're criticized, they say they're criticized because they're women. But anyway, oh, Charlie. Well, um, I, I think that she's I think she's new on the job. And I think that the first 15 to 20 words of her statement when she basically was saying, um, you know, she was saying to to paint the entire county police department with such a broad brush is inaccurate and if she had you know if she had stopped there but every single one of us at some point have not been able to to stop right there where we should and you just kind of it starts a stream of consciousness and i'm sure that at that moment she was thinking of all of her colleagues who work side by side with absolutely no acknowledgement, you know, no fanfare. They get the job done every day. But 
I think that, you know, she is certainly not the first leader of the police, of a police department, or, you know, a, a, a local political leader who has misspoken. So I think everybody needs to just take a deep breath and let her settle into so the are, job. Are, are I you don't, saying I don't, she, you're saying that she misspoke? No, I'm saying that I think that she I think that she probably went a little bit lengthier and and got a little bit into the weeds where she probably would have if she could do that over again, she probably would have been more succinct. And <laughs> that's that's what I that's what I think because I I believe the woman genuinely believes that among her officers and her colleagues, she might not see racism. She might not see racism. That doesn't make her a racist. Well, 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 well honey, no one's saying that uh, the new chief is a racist. We're just saying that this was really a tone-deaf way to go about it. I mean, the chief of police is like the president of university. Your, your real job is dealing with the legislature, dealing with the, uh, your public relations. And for uh, the new chief, the deny that there's any systemic racism in any police department, I, I think was a real mistake. Okay, I was just saying that she, that's not the first time. She has been a police time. officer in St. Louis County a long time, and it's like she forgot everything she has saw, heard, everything else <laughs> until three weeks ago when she became the chief. Now, Bill, I kind of agree with you in that that's what you're saying. Once you're in that job, it's different from the other jobs you have had. But that's my question to her is like, I don't think you can sit there and say that with confidence as the chief of three weeks based on what you have experienced throughout your, what, 20 some odd years as a St. Louis County police officer. I, that's where I thought I, that she aired, Wendy. And I, I, and I think, yeah. I think leaders are tone deaf all the time. Well, but I, and let's just let her settle in and maybe well, she'll have I would, a second, I would add to Al, Could I add to Alvin's question? The question that would be, have you turned on a television set in the last three weeks? I mean, you got to be kidding that this would be a, this should have been such an easy, you know, she didn't have to call out racism in the police department. She, the idea that she's essentially denying any possibility, essentially, of systemic racism in the county police was really, it was, it was. I disagree. I disagree respectfully with all of you uh, because the key word there is systemic. That means it's built into the system. It is. Of course, there's racism here and there, but I think it's insulting for you to suggest that it's systemic, that it's all part of how the officers operate on a daily basis. That's I what think I there said. are bad apples. Okay. There are bad apples, and they should be rooted out. But as you did say that, Wendy, out of all of the calls out there every day, police are putting their lives on the line, doing really good things. And you want to know something? It's not really in the press that much. There's no balance to that. So no wonder, Ray, you watched right. TV the last three but weeks. Charlie, you my have wait, wait, Charlie. Charlie. That Charlie. Everything is racist. My colleague Charlie. Art Holiday pointed out. My colleague Art Holiday pointed out this week. He's never seen an apple carrying a gun. You know that this is a very we we like to call them bad apples, but this is this is a position of great with great power attached to it and you have the power to take a life or to save a life thank god most police officers obviously save lives but for the ones who who do take life they have to be as as alvin said rooted out right off i agree charlie charlie you no agree. One, i keep hearing all these straw men and tonight no one said that mary barton's a racist or I, I didn't say that well, no, but somebody else, no one's saying she's a racist. No one's saying that every police officer is a racist. No one's saying that there are most police officers do amazing things. The word systemic lives, indicates missing that. Missing their jobs. No one's no. disrespecting police, but there is systemic that racism. Set up that way, Ray. All right, Charlie. There is um, systemic racism. Every police department does their study every year, and it shows that black people get pulled over Thank way you. more than any other kind of people. And they're That's right. Searched way more often than the other people. Oh, and by the way, less contraband is found in these cars than... Well, there's a reason for that. I can Hispanic explain that, Alvin. So, well, African Americans... Because they, you, know, you want to know something? Uh, this is a fact. In North Carolina, when they have those cameras, right? Yeah. Uh, street cameras, they find out that African Americans get more tickets from the cameras than 
other motorists. So then, Isn't it so, possible? So that, means, so that means any black man or woman you see driving down the street, you're at leisure to stop them because there's a greater chance that they may have broke the law. Okay. No, now that's, see, that's a straw kind of man. That's, that's a straw there. man. I'm no, saying. No, it's not. No, it's no. not. It's it, possible, don't you agree, that some African Americans, maybe in greater numbers than other groups, are driving without a license or headlights, perhaps because of poverty, and do, that I, is a reason I, they get Charlie, pulled over. Let me ask you this. Do more white people get let go for the same things that black people are doing? It's a fact that black people get sentenced to much longer sentences for the same crime than white people. These are all facts, okay? Now, well, that would be the court system. Any individual <laughs> police officer turn. or prosecutor a racist, but that, that's just a reality. And for the police chief to say, like, I don't see it, well, I said, like, it's it's all around you. Well, well Charlie, this, this is completely anecdotal, but I heard on the uh, radio Ozzie Smith talking about he and Willie McGee getting stopped. And uh, Ozzie Smith saying, what did we do, officers? And the uh, police officer saying, nothing yet. And, and you hear these stories all the time. And you don't hear them from Mark McGuire or Jimmy Edmonds. But, but you hear black people tell these stories all the time. So to suggest that there is no systemic racism in law enforcement, and, and maybe, maybe it's because... Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't I don't know, but I, ju I just well, think that uh, Chief Barton sh should have been a little more thoughtful. I, do, 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 but Bill, don't you remember back in the day when long hairs who were white got pulled over by the police all the time? I don't Charlie. believe that. And Charlie, well, I, I, that's I was, long I was, hair. Hey, that is a myth. Hair if you had long hair, hair driving a nice car in Ladue with a peace sign and said, I hate the police, they wouldn't have pulled you over because of who your mom and your uh, dad th were. That's true and, in Ladue. And that's true in Ladue. And they would drive you home if you were drunk. And I know that to be true. Charlie, uh, not Char Charlie, Charlie a lot, of, 30 seconds a lot to go. of differences of opinion about what to do to reform policing. But the idea that we... We're even having a conversation about whether there's systemic racism in, in our... I, I, I think, you know what? I think we should get a police officer on for a future edition and I pose that question them. to them. Yeah, I, 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 think, know, I know just a guy. And, okay, sounds good. Yeah, and okay. Wesley Bell and hey, Kim Gardner... We're going to be back in just a moment. Right. We're going to have Frank Viverito, president of the St. Louis Sports Commission, joining us. So don't touch that dial. Downeybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Downeybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Thanks for joining us for Downeybrook Part 2. And today we put on the hot seat Frank Viverito, the president of the St. Louis Sports Commission, who's been kind enough to share some of his time with us for this half hour. And Frank, just give us the lay of the land as we start off, because the Blues aren't playing. That's really sad because they might have been in the Stanley Cup at this time. The Cardinals aren't playing. Uh, college sports obviously have been on hiatus. What are you seeing out there? Any, any light at the end of the tunnel as far as you're concerned? I, I think so. What I'm seeing out there are, are a lot of leagues, a lot of universities, a lot of conferences, a lot of youth sports organizations <laughs> trying to figure out how to make this work. Uh, I don't know if they're all going to be able to do that because there's sort of layer upon layer of, of issues to deal with. There's there's financial issues, there's logistical issues, there's uh, medical issues that, you know, everybody has to be safe. Uh, there There's fan issues. And, and, and so kind of at this point, nothing would surprise me, but there's an awful lot of activity and an awful lot of people trying to make something happen to bring sports back. We'll start with Ray with a few okay. questions uh, here, folks. Yeah, Frank, um, there was a, a, a news story not long ago about an ex, the ex, XFL bankruptcy in yes. which your organization was misidentified, I think, in the lawsuit as yes. was, uh, confused with the CVC, the, the Tourism Commission. So I have two questions for you. One, 
why didn't you just let it go so you could get some money out of it? <laughs> and, and two, can you explain to the folks kind of the, how you are set apart from the CVC and, and how not to be confused? Sure. Um, you're right. The, the $1.3 million was tempting, but I think anybody's going to get any of that money. And, and so we were actually identified or misidentified as the league's uh, highest creditor uh, at, at significantly over a million dollars. Uh, completely erroneous, um, but often confused with the CDC. And, and it was the CDC's uh, 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 status as creditor over rent and expenses for the building. The biggest difference between the Sports Commission and the Convention and Visitors Commission is that the Sports Commission is a private nonprofit or organization that you know raises its own money to do what it does to to bring high profile sports uh, to the region, and and the CVC is a publicly funded uh, uh, organization that uh, uh, is actually a regional commission of the state, which promotes uh, the region and manages the dome. So you know we both have a point of convergence in terms of bringing business to the community. But, but the way that we're funded is, is completely different because we raise all of our money from the uh, corporate community as well as from the uh, events that we produce. So Frank, you're basically, I, I guess you're on hold. You know, we had the, uh, the, I guess, first couple of rounds of NCAA tournament. We're coming to St. Louis. Obviously, that did not happen because there was no tournament. Have you heard anything uh, just about future events? Because I know that you have to, bid on them and make your case for St. Louis years in advance. Have you heard officially from the NCAA that just that's all on hold till, you know, 2021? Or are you, you know, if, if you wanted to get the, the final four in, you know, 2024 or something like that, are they telling you, hey, forge ahead, still send yes. your best plan because we figure by that time we'll be back to somewhere near normal? So, so yeah. exactly what is your status is, is kind of what you do every day. Well, we lost 13 out of our 15 events that were scheduled for the first six months of, uh, of 2020. The only two events that we got in were the um, NHL All-Star Game with the Blues and the Missouri Valley Conference Basketball Tournament at Enterprise Center uh, in early March, which seems like forever ago. We, we were yeah. shaking hands and we had hand sanitizer, you know, on the concession stands and, and thought that was going to be okay. Um, but Alvin, to, to your point exactly, um, we are involved in, in multiple bid processes right now with the NCAA because all 600 of their championships for the years uh, between fall of 22 and spring of 26 are up for bid in a, in a process that will end uh, in October. And, and so none of the cities that, that lost events in calendar 2020 are guaranteed events in the next year because those events ha have been established and, and cited you know, many years ago. Um, but the cities that did lose events in 2020 will get um, extra consideration in the next bid cycle. So, so we bid for 51 different events um, in, in that four and a half year period in, in sports of all kinds, including, you know, men's and women's soccer at, at the new MLS stadium. Uh, you know, more men's basketball and women's basketball, uh, which we lost this year. Um, more wrestling, uh, the NCAA Frozen Four and Enterprise Center with the Blues, uh, gymnastics. And, and, and so we're in the thick of it uh, as it relates to uh, future business. Frank, if, 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 if I understand correctly, it sounds as if the NHL and the NHL Players Association if, if they can come to terms, they will enter phase three and they'll have their their training camp July 10th. Is that is that right? I think it, it begins July, -July. 10th. Mm -hmm. um, it's it seems kind of it, it, it seems kind of surreal when we think of hockey games or baseball games, you know, without fans in the stands. 
but um, are are the owners the, the ones that you have talked to, uh, whether it's the the folks with the Blues or the folks with the Cardinals, where are they just mentally with with all of this? I mean, are are they are are they adjusting to? Uh, the fact that we can't really plan for anything because we're riding this whole corona wave or, you know, it's it seems it seems like an awful lot for any business to bear, whether it's the small business or these these giant sports companies. Uh, I, I think you're right. Um, I, I think that that for a number of reasons, uh, they want to be back. Um, you're exactly right about the date that, that hockey is looking to come back, which is mid-July. Uh, I agree it's weird to be playing ice hockey in July, August, and September. Um, I, I was talking with uh, Dan McLaughlin, the, the voice of the Cardinals, uh, a couple days ago, and he said, I don't know how baseball is going to come back, but I can assure you that baseball will be back. I also heard that from from Rob Manfred on the Major League Baseball, you know, draft last night. So I think there's great resolve, even as the leagues say. And and I don't know how much of this, it, you know, we don't see the, the the financial books to know how good a business baseball is or how much money baseball may lose. But just for continuity and 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 for the fans, I, I think they want to be back and. and I think the fans want to see the leagues back as well. And and so whether it all come together, I, I don't know. But again, like I say, everybody's trying. Frank, uh, first of all, I, I want to tell you, I, I love that uh, poster behind you, the final four. I remember the Illini were in and it was thrilling. Illini almost won it. Oh, they, they well, it as a matter of fact, Illini fans still think that that they were national champions because North Carolina was had uh, academic problems. But, but at any rate, my, my question for you is: you, you Wait, your daughter went to Illinois, is that right? Y yes, she did. My daughter was a member of the Orange Crush. I probably and she was at the dome, Frank, at the time. I don't remember. Yep. But, uh, my, my question is: you mentioned uh, soccer. Do you already have an agreement with the uh, professional soccer team? to be able to use the new stadium for NCAA events? Uh, yes, it, it, in the sense that that we've worked with the MLS group, you know, Taylors and, and, and Jim Cavanaugh and, and his folks, and um, we have been planning from day one to be able to use that facility for as many events as, as we can bring to town. So one of those events, the highest profile uh, of those events, would be the NCAA soccer championships. So our hope would be to to maybe alternate year after year the the men's soccer championship and the women's soccer championship. In terms of of uh, other sports, you know, we're we're uh, uh, looking at at rugby, looking at lacrosse. Um, you know that 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 will be a multi-purpose stadium and uh you know god bless the tailors for investing as much as they have and uh uh you know it's it's right across the street from the sports commission offices and our offices are also two floors above the riverfront times office so, so i get sort of the the ray hartman the benefit of the ray hartman perspective I, by uh, osmosis I, I i work virtually but thanks and by the way i'm still trying to recover from bill mcclellan for the first time in 33 years uh, making a condescending remark about academic anything oh. <laughs> that's just that's just stunning um but but frank let me ask you this a couple of things um, talk about, well, first of all, what's the status of the MLS stadium? Do you know? Uh, oh, yeah. It, they're working on it every day. I, I know that, that the group wanted to be, has wanted to be much more visible right now in, in terms of, you know, naming rights and a name for the team and the colors and the jersey and, and all of that. And, and, and this isn't the time to be out selling. Uh, but it's, it's moving forward uh, uh, very impressively. Do you know when a completion date is? I just I didn't know. Yeah, they're, they're going to start a play in March of 2022. So we're less than two years out. 
And, uh, you know, my guess is it's going to be challenging to, to be ready for opening day, but that's the target. It, you talk about uh, the bidding process and without giving away the local Coca-Cola formula, what what does that look like? What, what do you do? What does your organization do to put together a bid for St. Louis for one of these many events? Well, um, every bid has... Um, some very similar points, and, and then every bid process has some very different um, uh, points to it. So w what we do is is uh, present the destination, and and that's the the, uh, the 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 geography, the demographics, the amenities, and, and the financials. Some events have very specific. Uh, financial requirements that need to be met. Uh, other events ask you to present a financial formula that you uh, uh, that you would propose in, in terms of a financial split or a financial guarantee. And then we'll turn around and and work with our partners in the community. You know, Enterprise Center and, and the Blues, the Cardinals and Bush Stadium, the CBC and the Dome, St. Louis U and Chaffetz Arena. Family Arena, uh, SIU Edwardsville, the St. Peter's Recplex. You know, we don't see boundaries, but but we'll assemble all those pieces and and then you know put our best foot forward. The 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 intangible side uh, of that is, is that we work every day, every week, every month uh, to build relationships with the event owners, the, the NCAA, uh, USA Gymnastics for the Olympic Gymnastics Trials, uh, USA Swimming, because we're looking to bid for the Olympic Trials in, in swimming. And, and we build those relationships and, and the experience that our organization has, the partners that we have in the community all kind of come together into one package, which is presented to the rights holder and, and then compared with other cities across the country. What about uh, senior golf, Frank? Any uh, senior golf coming to St. Louis? Yes, the uh, Ascension Charity Classic is still scheduled for the first week in October. And, uh, you know, Ascension ha has really taken the lead to bring that to the uh, community. Uh, and, and the proceeds from the event are all, all dedicated uh, to improving the uh, uh, the North County region and, and organizations in North County. So um, they got off to an absolutely flying start um, toward the end of last year in, in terms of, of sponsorship and, and visibility. The event will take place in North County at, at Norwood Hills. And, you know, I, I worry about the... Uh, um, the effect that that uh, you know that that this quiet period in, in terms of sales and sponsorship will have, and and whether or not they'll be able to get the uh, uh, the fans back out to the golf course. You know, golf is probably one of the easier uh, events for social distancing. You know, you're not confined to, to seating, and uh, you have plenty of space to spread out. Um, but but we're looking for that event to have a major impact on, on North County and the region for years to come. Whenever I played Alvin. golf in October, we used a leaf rule. Did they, <laughs> would they be doing that? I, I suspect that, uh, that, that October 1st through 4th will still be okay. Uh, but yeah, no, it, uh, ho hoping the weather will be outstanding and, and it'll be a good addition to the sports calendar. Alvin? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me something. No, I thought it was your turn. Dalla. No, I was going to say, Frank, I'm going to get a little bit serious with you here, Frank. All right. Okay. This I hear this all the time. We read this all the time. Quote, unquote, I would go to more sporting events downtown if not for the crime. So when you hear that, what is your response? You know, my response is that, that, that everybody has to do better. To, to present a welcoming environment uh, to, to fans, whether they're local fans or, or whether they're visitors, because that's an important issue, and, it, and it's becoming an even more important issue. And, and, and so I, I think, you know, everything's on the table, that, that the, 
you know, the, 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 the owners and operators, specifically the, you know, the Cardinals in the blues and, and uh, other facilities downtown, you know, are, have to look at, at everything from, you know, from, from lighting to parking to, you know, a- entertainment and, and access to safety. I mean, it, it, it is all a very significant concern. It, it has been uh, for, for quite some time. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to become even more so. Hey, I'll follow up on I, that and totally in a different direction. But I think there's two people in St. Louis that if uh, Roger Goodell of the National Football League called us tonight that would take the call, I would take the call. I think you would take the call too. What would you tell him? Well, um, I tell him there's still a few things to be <laughs> to make right fr- from the last time that they were here. But but I'd also tell him, and you know maybe the XFL is a good example of this. Maybe not. I you know I, I I'd always tell him that that St. Louis is is a great sports town and, and a great football town. And and you know we were here for. Uh, only uh, five years of, of the Big Red, but I worked at Bush Stadium that time, and and those fans cared about that team. You know, I think that, that you know, not to get into the whole city, county, government structure issue, but, but you know, we have problems in, in terms of, of financing stadiums, et cetera. But uh, I, I would certainly tell them that... Uh, St. Louis is a great uh, is a great sports town and a great football town. So you wouldn't just tell them go away. We don't like you. Well, I'm not sure that I would put a nickel on the table, you know, to to, to bring back the NFL. I I think we've been there and and done that. But you know, I I think there's still very significant feeling, you know, that 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 this region and these fans were wrong. And, and maybe that will play out, you know, financially in, in terms of the lawsuits that, that, that exist uh, in the courts right now. But, but I think that's, that is one of the reasons that the XFL was successful, because the fans really do care ab- about this community and, 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 and want to see that wrong righted. I have a nickel. And I'll put it on the table to, for get an NFL that, team? To, get that, to get them to come back. I have two questions for you, Frank. Um, one would be, first of all, who are we competing against? Because obviously we're all very proud of our city and our region. So we like to think that we're competing against Chicago and Philadelphia and New York. Are we really competing against the larger markets? And then two, contractually, when, you know, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch just ran that story about all of the furloughs and the hotels and, you know, especially downtown it being hit so hard, um, are, are the, the, the owners of these businesses, um, are, are, is everybody kind of being flexible and approaching this in the right spirit? Because contractually, not knowing, it, contractually things have to kind of be in limbo and sort of a nightmare for you. Yes. Uh, I'm not always that good with two questions, but I... I oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Neither so, am I. So the first, the first question, um, St. Louis is a first-tier sports destination. And, and interestingly enough, the cities that you mentioned, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, are not necessarily the, the most competitive cities uh, for, for uh, bidding on events. Uh, wow. Many cases, uh, availability is less. Uh, um, hotel uh, costs are, are exorbitant, uh, and, and so the the most desirable cities you'll find are sort of second tier demographically or in terms of population. Cities okay. like Indianapolis, San Antonio, Nashville, uh, St. Louis, uh, Atlanta, Dallas. Houston, th- those are the cities that aggressively pursue the, uh, the the event business and and can generally do a better job of hosting. Them. In in terms of you know our our our, our many things uh, up in the air and our our businesses doing what they can. Yes, businesses are doing what they can. First of all, uh, every city is experiencing the same I- issues right now. You know, in, in terms of hotel occupancy and right. restaurant business, etc. Um, but 
but one of the uh, uh, one of the stories that I saw this week was that the Marriott Grand had let go of all of its staff. But but right now um, we're in the middle of a uh, bid process for the 2024 United States Olympic Swimming Trials, which is an event that would cause us to uh, to install two million gallon portable pools on the floor of the convention center and the dome and and would bring uh, upwards of 300,000 fans through the wow. over eight days wow. uh, in uh, in in June of 2024 tens of millions of dollars of economic impact um, we're working every day with the staff of the of the Marriott Grand uh, t- to put together that that bid, and and so I, I can't tell you whether or not you know that those folks are are furloughed or if they're working on their own time, but but they care about future business be, because they they have to, and 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 so you know it, it's not always high profile front page news stories that the layoffs are, but you know they, they're in their swing and right now. Uh, Frank, is the XFL going to make a comeback, or is St. Louis going to get its team back? Well, Bill, um, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I, I think you saw um, Vince McMahon, who had owned the league, uh, you know, test the water a, a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I also think... That, that strategically the, the league may not have set out on the right path in, in the sense that St. Louis was the only market that didn't have the uh, an NFL team in the market. And, and so I would liken it to, um, you know, if, if there was a, an, another baseball league that, that came out and, and, you know, as soon as the World Series was over at Bush Stadium, we had a AAA minor league team out there who – would really uh, care uh, about that, and and so uh, I, as I said, I don't think the strategy was necessarily right, and and I don't think you, you saw anywhere close to the support uh, for other teams in the league that that you saw here in St. Louis, and 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 so I think it's at this point, you know, too expensive an undertaking. Uh, uh, th- there were too many people hurt and, and harmed by the financial bankruptcy, uh, and and what you saw was the league, you know, returning this time after trying it 20 years ago in a different incarnation. So so maybe 20 years from now, somebody will will you know <laughs> stop the brand and try to bring it back, um, but but I don't think it's going to happen uh, anytime soon. Frank, is your uh, organization working with Dan Buck to bring amateur athletics to the St. Louis Mills? And, and not just a- amateur athletics, but but youth sports. And you know, I, I've seen the numbers that um, that youth sports a- aggregated a- actually generate more revenue th- than the NFL. And and one of the problems I- in the region. And again, not to get back to the governmental structure, but but because all the communities in St. Louis tend to build the same recreational complex, so we you know we've got one every three or four miles down Manchester Road. But but what we don't end up with are are facilities that can host large national or regional youth sports tournaments. That, that can uh, uh, have facilities to, to train potential uh, elite athletes. And, and Dan's project is, you know, kind of playing catch up in, uh, in the country that, that many communities, you know, nearby like Overland Park, Kansas, or, or, or far away like uh, Cooperstown, New York, ha- have invested a, a lot of money in high profile, high amenity youth sports facilities. And, and you know, c- kudos to Dan, who, who's, you know, who doesn't have deep pockets, you know, tr- trying to work with different communities in the region 
Um, you know, the, the, the idea that, that it can go in, in Hazelwood and, and reuse a facility I instead of having to invest to build a facility, uh, I think is very attractive. And, and as we, you know, build our facilities, we build our abilities to, to bring those types of events to the region. It's well, I'll tell you, Frank, uh, uh, business. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this, but we're so grateful that you could share the benefits of your knowledge with our viewers on this edition of Donnybrook Part Two. Thank you so much. Uh, go Cardinals, go Blues, go Billikens, go everybody, and um, go Jayhawks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello to everybody at the St. Louis Sports Commission, Thank Frank. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Thank, Thank you, Frank. you all. Downey Brook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network.